Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by 100 Bogart Street, a co-working building in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Need a professional place to work from? Learn more by visiting 100bogart.com. Hey, this is Luke, host of Bushwick Podcast here on Heritage Radio Network. Before joining HRN, I was a fan. For the past 10 years, HRN has been sharing the most original and innovative stories on food and culture from around the globe. While the staff and hosts make it look easy, it's hard work, especially with limited resources. As an independent, member-supported nonprofit, we rely on listeners like you to help us share the very best. Personally, I'm honored to be a part of Heritage Radio Network, and I invite you to join us in our mission to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. Help us start HRN's second decade stronger than ever by becoming a member today at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. You can even show your love for Bushwick Podcast by selecting our show from the designation drop-down menu when you sign up. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening to HRN. I'm Luke Griffin, and you're listening to Bushwick Podcast, local stories for a strong community. Each week, we take you behind the scenes of the artists, activists, and entrepreneurs whose journeys collide in Bushwick, a special Brooklyn neighborhood that's changing faster by the day. Spend enough time around Bushwick's artists, activists, and entrepreneurs, and you'll start to hear the same name over and over again. In Bushwick, there's uh, the Mayday space where you can get involved, you know? I reach out to the Mayday space because I think they're doing great work, and I I hope in the future we can collaborate. I'm thinking about Mayday's community agreement, low ego, high impact. The meeting is going to take place at Mayday Space. At Mayday Space in Bushwick, this beautiful old church space run by this amazing collective. This week, we visit Mayday Space, one of Bushwick's most vital resources for everyone from local elected officials to activist groups to amateur wrestlers. It's Wednesday, July 3rd, and this episode is called A Path towards something better. Bushwick is full of different movements, from cooperative businesses to healing meetups to protest art groups. While they're unique in countless ways, they're the same in at least one. They all need a home. And for many of Bushwick's movements, that home is a converted old church building on St. Nicholas Avenue called Mayday Space. So right in front of us is a big two-story building with bright red doors um, that's home to both Mayday Space and our partners, a congregation, Bushwick Abbey, and another church congregation, Iglesia Santa Cruz. That's Josh Carrera, one of the members of Mayday's leadership team known as the Mayday Collective. My name is Josh Carrera. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns. I am on the Mayday Collective, and I'm also staff. I'm our project coordinator. To learn more about Mayday and the work they're doing here in the community, we visited the space to meet with Josh and his teammate, Ziad Hamad. Uh, My name is Ziad Hamad. 
I use he, him pronouns, and I'm also in the collective of Mayday. If you're new to Mayday, one of the first things you'll notice about the space is how large it is. Filling 5,000 square feet across three floors in what seems like an old Sunday school, Mayday occupies a winding collection of multi-purpose spaces, from a room for organizing. This second floor right here is kind of where Mayday does all of its organizing. To a library. What we're looking at is a bunch of books, around 200 that were all donated by volunteers. To an arts room. And this room is managed and operated by an all-volunteer-led art collective called the People's Collective Arts. To even a massive kind of ballroom. You see how ginormous it is and how big it is, and you immediately see all the potential that you can kind of do in this space. So this giant floor can hold up to 200 people. We have a full-use kitchen. We have a storage room. Um, we have ACs all throughout the rooms. And really, this space is used for big, big meetings. As you pass the various banners, flyers, and posters hung throughout each of these spaces, it's clear that Mayday is tapped for a wide variety of uses. We just had um, a local Alcoholics Anonymous group celebrate one year of not drinking um, and being alcohol-free, and that was cool that that happens at Mayday. Um, other things that have happened here are quinceañeras, sweet 16s, community potlucks, film screenings. As Josh and Ziad put it, one way to think of Mayday is as a home for social movements. And while that might typically refer to more progressive or social justice-oriented groups, the community that rents out the various spaces here is surprising and diverse. Take, for example, some of the previous groups we featured on this show. Everyone from the Bushwick Food Co-op to Sacred Circle Theater to Mikasa Noe Sukasa have all utilized Mayday space in one way or another. But Mayday is about more than just renting a physical space to different groups in the neighborhood. Another way to think about who we are, what we do, is that one, we're an organizing center. Basically that we um, allow anyone to use the space that fits within our mission um, to either rent the space for their own programming um, or their events. Um, and we're also a movement project. So by a movement project, I mean Mayday as a collective, as, in, as a group of volunteers, as staff, we put our own programs that are distinct from what people do in the space, and that's really connected to our mission of, of supporting movements in the neighborhood and across the city. At its core, Mayday is as much about catalyzing movements as it is about housing them. This two-pronged approach is rooted in the Mayday Project's very beginning, when it was founded by a group of activists who'd come together to support a rising tide of social action. The idea of Mayday um, started around 2013, 2014 um, by um, what was the collective at, at the time, which was Sandy Nurse, Luca Shapiro, who remain on the collective, and in addition to that, the two co-founders of Star Bar, McNair and Anna. So they had this idea, those, those four people um, who are still a core part of the vision, um, had an idea for for a, a hub in the city that would be a home to social movements. And they also came from social movements themselves. They were involved in Occupy Wall Street and the uh, anti-globalization struggles of the 1990s. Some of them worked for Democracy Now! So they were already in this world of activism and they wanted to build a home to contain these movements and help them incubate them and grow them. That founding collective chose a name, Mayday, that reflected the spirit they wanted the project to capture. The urgency and importance of a distress call, the vitality and reverence of a May harvest ritual, and the left-leaning progressivism evoked by the May 1st labor holiday, also called May Day. Originally, space wasn't the primary focus, and the project was housed within its sister organization, the progressive-friendly Star Bar near Maria Hernandez Park. But that changed as May Day picked up momentum. We first got our big boost when we decided to hold the host the art production of the People's Climate March in 2014, which was the largest climate mobilization, I think, in the history of this country and maybe the world. So that's kind of like where Mayday got its legs. And after the march happened, there was a lot of energy and activism, and we were finally able to transform that energy into bringing Mayday space into life. And so 
um, unfortunately, what when they didn't when that happened, all that activity scared a little bit um, the landlord at that at that time, and we had to find a new place, a new home, and that's how we ended up over here on 176 St. Nicholas, um, and it's it's actually been a blessing um, that we that we didn't anticipate. As Mayday came to stand on its own legs and grew into its new home base, where it remains today, it became a resource not just for broad issues like the People's Climate March, but for local community issues here in Bushwick. Part of the importance of Mayday is that these folks who came from social movements were actually able to connect with activists who are from Bushwick or have been doing work in Bushwick, also artists who are Bushwick natives or, you know, from the Latinx diaspora who are working to counter some of the things that had ha- had been happening in Bushwick that are detrimental to the neighborhood. So the leadership of Mayday was able to meet with some of these folks and try to build something together. In the more than five years that Mayday has been operating, the project has developed an impressive community of organizations and individuals who use the space. According to Mayday's 2018 annual report, it hosted more than 198 events for over 100 different groups last year alone. But what does that actually look like? And what is it all working toward? The community that passes through Mayday's doors is, in a word, eclectic. It ranges, and and the range is is huge. We have um, this group called Green City Task Force, that books the space pretty frequently and they train young adults living in um, NYCHA buildings to be part of a green economy job force. So that's something that's been happening here for more than a year. Other examples of things that happened here, we had a wrestling series that brought out a lot of kids and families. Mayday is home to a wide range of groups and yes, Sometimes that even includes wrestlers. Yeah, so people on the second floor was like the, what's the area called when you're changing your clothes in the, the back? The green room? Yeah, it was like the second floor was the green room, so there was a bunch of dudes and underwears. Um, and then the third floor was the ring. It was the actual ring. It was a huge ring, and it was just like a WWE wrestling match. We had a vendor food set up, um, you know, real roles where these wrestlers were playing out. And we're thinking about bringing that series back because it it brings families out. Not not everything we do always brings families out. And we want to bring more kids and and their parents out. So, yeah, it was was a lot of fun. I was really mad that I missed it. (laughs) That may sound a bit surprising for a project founded on the back of progressive social movements, but it's a great example of Mayday's real impact. The space brings together different groups and exposes people to new and unexpected ideas. You know, that's something that to us was super fun because there was nothing inherently political or activist-y about about it. But you're coming to see wrestling here and then you see a sign that says decolonize the hood or the the bathroom is gender neutral and who knows if that's happening at other wrestling events. So that's another example of, of something that happens here. So it's really a mix. It's a mix of things that bring people out for something fun, versus something that's more tied to the mission, versus like you're an organization that books the space and don't necessarily are connected to Mayday, but you like the space. And so there's this like commingling that's naturally happening between different values of different individuals and groups and we're coexisting together. As random as the broader Mayday community could seem on its face, it's actually quite thoughtful. And as Ziad and Josh explain, all the events that pass through the space align with Mayday's broader goals of positive social impact. For example, there's a project housed out of here, a language justice project, which teaches people uh, Spanish and Arabic from a social justice perspective. Um, And the way we select students for that, we usually have a long wait list. And the people who are at the top of that wait list are the folks who work with affected communities who are Spanish speakers, who are Arabic speakers. Um, on issues of immigration or like housing. So everything we do is colored by the mission um, in one way or another. It might not be obvious to people. People might say, oh, this is just a language class. No, it's really about why are we offering this class in the first place, you know? Anyone can offer a language class. So we're really proud to house 
People's Collective Arts and also the Language Justice Project um, who work on those things. And I mean, language justice, another thing they do is they use the cost of language classes from people who can pay into uh, Spanish and Arabic classes to subsidize free English classes for Spanish speakers in the neighborhood. So that is one thing that we are really proud that they do in this space. It's and in this summer, we're bringing um, Mixteca classes, which are which is a, an indigenous language in Mexico, and Bushwick has a significant population of folks where that is their first language, and Spanish is actually their second language. So we're actually going to bring Mixteco classes, um, or Mixteco to Spanish classes, for for those indigenous folks that live and work in this community. While so much of Mayday's day-to-day effects in Bushwick can be felt through the work of the projects it houses, it's important to remember that Mayday is also its own organization with its own mission. After the break, we take a look at the people behind Mayday and the goals they're working toward in Bushwick and beyond. This episode is brought to you by 100 Bogart, a new building in Bushwick, Brooklyn, that provides offices, co-working, event spaces, and a brand new podcast recording room. Have you been dreaming of starting your very own podcast in Brooklyn? You can now rent space in 100 Bogart's custom-built podcast room to record interviews, voiceover, and commentary. The room is fitted out with two microphones, mixing board, and a MacBook Pro running Pro Tools. You can rent the space by the hour, and a rental of an hour or more includes a 100 Bogart co-working pass. That means complimentary coffee, tea, and access to your own desk for the rest of the day. So what are you waiting for? Get started on your next audio project. 100 Bogart has the space and amenities you need to kickstart your podcast. Learn more at 100bogart.com or call their team at 718 318- 362-3539. The people behind Mayday fall into a few different camps. There's a staff of just two, which is Josh and a teammate, Rahel, who are responsible for managing the operations of the space, like bookings. But setting priorities and calling the shots for the broader Mayday project is the volunteer leadership group of a little more than a half dozen individuals called the Mayday Collective. So the vision, the mission, and the financial stability of the organization is held in the hands of the, our leadership body, which is called the collective, and that operates like a board as well. Because we are a small, small organization, we do rely a lot on the collective, which is completely volunteer-led, to keep us moving and to keep us inspired and to keep us out connected to movements and kind of like what we should be focusing on and really like make sure that the vision is being operationalized at every step of the way. Like the people who book Mayday Space, the people who make up the collective come from a variety of backgrounds. Someone that works for the Department of Education, someone that works for a study abroad program. We have a gardener and a carpenter. We have someone that oversees the Left Forum, which is like this annual gathering of socialists and academics. So it it varies, but I would say they're all connected to activism and movements, but not necessarily like nonprofits or business or office. Josh and Ziad describe the collective's leadership as being very intentional. They make every major decision for Mayday on matters from the space to their organizational priorities through a consensus process, which means that they need to find a way to agree on just about everything. But in a group with strong and varied opinions on things like social impact and theories of change, that process can be demanding. And it really is a handful. I mean, people think that a volunteer gig is something that you do on the weekends. We're very active. This is like a second job, um, a third job for some of us. A number of us are involved in other projects. And so the leadership body meets as often as possible. We also talk a lot. As challenging as that process might be at times, the collective is united and grounded by their commitment to positive change. And at the end of the day, they're not alone. Much of the work that makes Mayday such a helpful resource in Bushwick isn't done by the collective or Mayday staff. It's done by volunteers. People from around the community and across the city help Mayday do everything from put on events to beautify the space. The average volunteer is someone that 
is looking for community. Most of the times that I've met with folks, they're looking for a community of like-minded people that want to do something for the neighborhood, want to be involved, want to create disruption and trouble, and they come with a lot of ideas, and they also come with a, with a big commitment. We have volunteers that have an idea and want to do it, and then we have other volunteers that are saying, tell me what to do and I'll do it. The volunteers tend to skew younger, and as Josh and Ziad put it, student adjacent. And while they note that the volunteers' backgrounds are fairly mixed, Mayday is making efforts to continue to diversify its volunteer community. It's pretty mixed, but I would say we try to emphasize bringing more people of color and more queer folks into the space. Um, Sometimes that is a struggle because it does get saturated with like some of the groups. Some of the bigger groups that come in tend to be like people who are not from New York or people who are usually white. It's like, that's a struggle, but it is not just something that Mayday deals with. It's every organization, I think, in the city that's trying to uplift uh, the voices of people in struggle. Uh, not to say that white people are not in struggle, but that is, that is one of our priorities at Mayday Space. In addition to the project's volunteers, Mayday also receives support from another camp, which it calls its sustainers. These are people who provide a monthly financial donation, which, according to Mayday's annual report, ranges anywhere from 5 to $50. We have around 60 people that are given a contribution a month. The average donation of our sustainer is $6.50. So that means that it's really affordable to chip in and help finance this project. Josh and Ziad emphasize that Mayday runs in the black and is extremely disciplined about how it allocates its funds. Moreover, the collective hold themselves accountable to their community, taking steps like publishing their annual report, which includes a breakdown of finances, and regularly soliciting input from a wide range of their volunteers, sustainers, and partners. For all this work, all that Mayday does to house and incubate different movements, you may be wondering, what does this all add up to? To put it simply, if no less ambitiously, Mayday is working to dismantle capitalism. When I think about like a specific agenda that we have, I, I would say it's both broad and specific. Broad because, I mean, we're, we're trying to build an alternative to capitalism, and that's like the most broad thing you could ever say, right? Um, I would say everyone in our leadership is anti-capitalist at heart. We all have different theories of change of how we do that, but that's like a core value that we share. And how you get specific in that, it's, you know, that's, that's like the big question of the left. Um, specifically, we want to expand the political imagination of what's possible in our struggles in Bushwick. So one example of that is the current housing struggle. Um, in Bushwick, we've seen the wave of hypergentrification hit this neighborhood over the past 15 years. They, it's not going to stop. In fact, at the local level, there's an attempt to change the density of the neighborhood, of certain parts of the neighborhood, through a process that's known as rezoning that we know and and our community knows, or at least part of our community knows, that it's not going to really build more affordable housing for people. And so we're fighting that. Um, so that's, that's one specific concrete way where we're trying to live out our values. But more broadly speaking, we believe that our struggles are led by people on the ground and that we're not going to always have all the answers, which is why we have this mission of just being the home for movements and the movements defining which way we go. On a high level, the Mayday Project is working toward a world where something like Mayday Space would exist on its own terms, unbeholden to things like real estate markets and driven purely by its service to the community. How Mayday puts that into practice today, by letting the movements it houses and form the policies behind the organization itself, is a unique approach driven by what seems to be a belief at the heart of Mayday's work. That in order to see positive change, a community needs a kind of pathway, and that a place like Mayday can be the starting point. People go to work, and then they go home, and they watch a TV show, and then the next day they worry about their job or their house, uh, but they can't do anything about it because there's no way to connect with other people around these issues. You know, you can talk to your coworkers, but that has a limit. 
Uh, you can talk to people that live in your building, but that has a limit. We're hoping that May Day is one of the places where, where people sense this frustration with the system that is exploiting them and really offers no solutions. People can go to the space and say, hey, I heard about, it's like, beacon for progressive activism. You know, I don't really know anything about this, but I want to, like, talk to someone about, like, what's going on in my building. Do you know someone who, like, works in housing? Or, like, this is going on with my health healthcare. Like, can I get some information on this? That's the goal, is for Mayday to become this place where people who are kind of disaffected by the society that we're living in can come here and talk to someone about material issues that they're facing and really connect with other people, find a solution, and maybe build, like Josh said, like an action or a protest or like engage with like legislators or like whatever they want to do. They just need a starting point. And Mayday should be the starting point, but it should also carry that energy to the point of completion, I guess. I mean, the point of completion is very far down the horizon, but to get them started and to carry that energy, that's what Mayday wants to do. And the beautiful thing is that if someone comes here or an idea is born here, it can continue here or we create space for it to live somewhere else. So we're very proud to be in this ecosystem of spaces that are different from Mayday, but we're still in the same hub of, you know, thinking about alternative futures to our world. And so we're not limited to what happens here. In fact, we love to share news and opportunities at other spaces. So when people book the space and I handle the bookings and they can't meet here, or if I know that what they're looking for would be better at another space, I always tell them about the other space. We reshare their stuff on Instagram or, or Facebook. So we're very much in that ethos of like, we're, we're important, but we're important together. It's not, it's not just about us. Ultimately, building an alternative to capitalism from within a capitalist society is hard, and Mayday is forced to walk the fine line of pursuing their mission without compromising their values. That, of course, means making the most of non-ideal circumstances and confronting the challenges of staying afloat in a gentrifying neighborhood. We have to pay rent. I mean, just straightforward. We have to pay rent, and we're fortunate enough that we pay rent or... We give a contribution to our partner, which is the church, Iglesia Santa Cruz, and that allows us to fulfill our mission of giving affordable space to grassroots groups. Unfortunately, the building that we're in is a crumbling building. It's an old building, and it's inherently inaccessible um, to a lot of people. It's not ADA compliant if you don't have... If you're on a wheelchair, you can't go up to the third floor. It's difficult for folks that have strollers. It's, it's just a building that's, that has a lot of inequities built into it. And one of the struggles of this capitalist system that we live in, specifically in Bushwick, is that rent is so, so high that we are struggling to find a new home to help us better live out our mission. Today, the maintenance issues in Mayday's current building, old as it is, have reached a tipping point that now threatens the organization's ability to operate. And after years of providing a home for so many, Mayday is now searching for a new home for itself. While that poses new capitalist obstacles, it also presents an opportunity to reimagine Mayday space and manifest an even better, even bolder version of the project. So in a new space, it has to be ADA compliant um, at all levels, which means it's going to be accessible to no matter who walks in there. And so we're going to need someone that has that expertise that can walk through a building and ha and help us be like, this is what you need to make it accessible and this is what you won't need. Um, there might be, you know, ideally there's a first floor where there's big windows that are that you can see into the space and, 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 and it feels welcoming. So ideally something with a first floor retail space availability where we can set up a coffee shop or, or something where people can hang out. Um, again, like I said, 5,000 square feet, um, ideally a roof where we can maybe create like a roof garden project or something like that. N nearby a train station, that's very important as well. As Mayday searches for its new home, it's buoyed, as always, by its most powerful asset, its community, which remains dedicated to the project's vision. 
we have a really good team and we have people really believe in the mission of the space and I think that is what what carries the energy of the space through is really a belief that we should continue to do this and that there should be spaces like this across the city and across the country um, I mean we we want to stay in Bushwick we find that this is our community and this is the place that we want to build something for the people who live here we want to set an example that gentrification can be fought off and it should it should be fought off for the benefit of the people who have lived here for long enough and who can't afford to live anywhere else really um, but we want more places where people are reflective of, you know, how can you build a space that is anti-capitalist um, while also, you know, working on a skeleton staff. Like, it's really, it's really hard. It's a big commitment to ask of people to, to volunteer their time in this way. In the meantime, given their immediate capitalist constraints, Josh, Ziad, and the rest of the team have begun investigating more near-term solutions. One specific tool or thing that could be this non-capitalist solution, at least in the short term and potentially into the future, is something that Ziad and I have been learning a little bit about, uh, which, which are called community land trusts, which are these like economic um, structures set up to remove land from speculation and from the market and it's land that's controlled and managed by a fund or a nonprofit. And so in an ideal scenario, Maydays as a space, a building, exists on land that, that, that will never be threatened by the real estate market um, or any other market. And there is a growing movement in the city around community land trusts, specifically around housing. Um, but there are people thinking like we need this for all kinds of public goods. Because May, when Mayday offer it, it is a public good, just like a park. You know, there's like land trust for parks. Some housing in the city is in forms of land trusts. So that could be one potential scenario of a non-capitalist structure that we could operate under. And we, we, we need more of that. However Mayday's future in the neighborhood might manifest, they're looking to their next steps with an eye toward how to make the spaces they hold even more accessible for the community. We're really trying to find a way for... It to be a comfortable space where people can come in and not worry about the politics so much and more focus on the issue that they have and you know not have it be about quote socialism or whatever you know and not an ideology but rather like a path towards something better as they work to make that a reality there are plenty of ways for new people to become involved the collective holds building improvement parties every third wednesday of the month and more generally encourages anyone interested to come see the space for themselves. So for anyone listening out there that wants to get involved or wants to learn more, I'm here, this is Josh, I'm here at Mayday every day, 9 to 5, so please stop by, and sometimes, or oftentimes, Rahel is here in the evenings. We are working on an anti-July 4th, anti-patriotic barbecue, so for any of you out there that um, are just overwhelmed with the red, white, and blue that happens on that day, Come hang out at May Day. We're going to have a barbecue and stay tuned. And then, yeah, that's pretty. That's, that's what's coming up in the next few weeks. But if you have an idea, if you have a project and you want to bring it to life here, you know, you can reach out to us at social media, stop by the space, and let's chat. Real patriots protest unjust laws. Listen to your founding fathers. They said that. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a great summary of what we have going on. But... If you want to know more, you can sign up to our email list online or in person. We have email lists here. Um, but yeah, we're usually happy to chat about developing a project. So if you want to talk to any collective member, any staff member, uh, we can put you in touch with the right person. Um, what I would like to see more of is maybe continuing to foster relationships between political groups. So if you're an activist, who's a part of an organization, um, and maybe you don't come to Bushwick that often, come say hi, and we'll see, you know, maybe we can do something citywide or put you in touch with someone who is in the neighborhood who has similar goals as you do. That might be fun. Getting in touch with the Mayday team is easy. Yeah, so on Facebook, Mayday Space, on Instagram, at Mayday Space, email, info at maydayspace.org, and it's pretty much the, the quickest ways we always respond within 48 hours 
on email or social media. So you can reach us through there. We've got all that info and more in the show notes for this week's episode. If you have any leads on new spaces that might be a good fit for Mayday's next home, you should get in touch. We'd like to extend our sincere thanks to Josh, Zied, and all the folks behind Mayday Space for opening a window into the work they do throughout the community. And of course, we'd also like to thank you for tuning in this week. If you enjoy Bushwick Podcast, you can do us a huge favor by telling a friend or even by leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform, which helps us reach even more new listeners with stories like these. We're going to be on a brief hiatus for the next couple of weeks, but we'll be back the week of July 22nd with another story you won't want to miss. In the meantime, did you know that Bushwick Podcast is made by people just like you? We love your thoughts and your help. If you have questions, comments, or want to get involved, send us an email to hello at hearbushwick.com. That's H-E-A-R bushwick.com. Or you can always DM us on our Instagram page at Bushwick Podcast. We look forward to hearing from you soon, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.